Are you ready to increase your retention and revenue and convert website traffic to clients? Then you're ready for Maya. Maya is a marketing and client recruitment software. Maya creates better business relationships by pairing the right clients with the right beauty professionals. How do we do it? The matchmaker. Your brand will have its own unique matchmaking survey. By pairing people based on their skill set, budget, personality, and lifestyle preferences, Maya creates lasting relationships that keep both sides coming back for more. You don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Pair the right clients with the right beauty pros the first time. Visit joinmaya.com to get started. Thank you for joining me. This is Katie Whitledge with the Beyond the Technique podcast. We're going to talk about grow 43% this year. I mean, most people are hoping to have a little bit of growth, whether that's a 10% increase or 20% increase compared to last year. But we have an award-winning salon owner here today, first-time guest that is going to share how her company grew 43% this year. I have Janet Wetz here my home girl from the north we are sister states she joins us all the way from new london minnesota and let me just tell you a bit about janet she is currently a salon owner a hairstylist and salon business coach with inspiring champions she is recently awarded as uh, an honored as a top 200 salon throughout north america which is incredible She is passionate about teaching, coaching, and growing small town stylists and helping them create a life they never knew was possible. She's got a really incredible journey starting off actually as a nail technician. I can't wait to learn what has brought her here today and all the way to having massive, massive growth. Without further ado, help me welcome Janet. Janet, welcome to Beyond the Technique podcast. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I'm really excited to get to know you. And we're so close in state that I'm surprised we haven't actually met yet, but never, you know, it's better late than never. So here we are. Um, And it sounds like you have quite the history in the beauty industry. So I'd love to hear from the beginning, like, how did you get into the industry? And what did that look like for you? Well, it's, uh, it is a little interesting because I was that tomboy growing up and uh, I never did my hair, never did my makeup, never polished my nails, but out of high school, it was either you could work back then, you could work in a group home, uh, the service industry, or you could go to college. And I did sign up for college and then I ended up not going because I knew I, w- I was a lab technician. There's no way I could sit inside in a lab all day. So I went to the college and said, what's the shortest course you have? And it was nail technician and it was three months. So I didn't even know what it was, which luckily for me, you get to work with your hands and people all day, every day and grow your skills. So kind of bloomed from there. And uh, then I got a job at a salon and the, for years, those girls told me, you need to go back to school for hair. I'm like, oh, I can't touch hair. It's gross, blah, blah, blah. And uh, one day as I'm filing a foot, there's oh, all this literally. foot skin all over my arm. I'm like, why can't I do hair? So uh, I signed up for the hair course that very week. So, and it kind of went from there. And I have, uh, I've worked in a commission salon. I've done booth rent. I have done suite rental loosely in our area. And also now I own my own salon that is uh, commission. And we have commission stylists and we're branching out into hybrid to accommodate these uh, commission stylists that are ready to move on to booth rent or suite rent, but still have the safety net of if it really doesn't, it's not for them, they can come back in the same space and just transition back to commission. Okay. There's so much to unpack here. Um <laughs> yeah. you- yeah, you made this kind of switch from nails to hair. I'm curious, just for the fun of it, did you decide when you got into cosmetology to continue to do hair and nails, or did you pivot completely and just go all in with hair? Yeah, I uh, continued to do both. And uh, what was it, last year or two years ago, I transitioned out of nails completely. And I just, too much on my plate. You You really do need to 
focus and some things had to go. So I really had to run the numbers in my business and look at what is that low hanging fruit, we call it. And uh, nails, unfortunately, was one of them. And men's and kids cuts had to go as well, which is kind of sad, but I still get to see those people. Oh, well, now there's even more to unpack in this story. Okay, well, let's go back to what brought you to salon ownership specifically? Like, at what point did you realize, like, I want to go down this this path? That, that part is interesting. I was a uh, booth rent stylist and was doing well, according to what I thought at the time. Uh, knowing what I know now, I was doing well. I could have done so much better. But what what led me to opening my own place was my mentor would say, I'm never going to be able to retire. And I looked to her as my mentor. And she's a wonderful person. I love her. She shaped me. Uh, but I wanted to retire. So I needed to move on and do it. There had to be a better way, a different way. So that's what led me to opening my own so I could retire someday. Interesting. Okay. So when you first became a salon owner, what came the easiest for you and what do you feel was the most challenging part to it? Oh, that is so easy and interesting. Really. Um, what came easiest is numbers and tracking and systems, but the hard part was leadership. <laughs> And you know, it's interesting and not necessarily that leadership would come easy for a new salon owner, but that numbers was your easiest. Um, where did that skill set develop in your life? Uh, you know, I think it's just an innate ability for me. Um, just because typically our, the creative, us creatives, hairstylists, are not numbers driven. We're, what is it, right brain, left brain, however that is. It's the creatives are one side and the numbers are the other. And typically there's not a lot of us numbers driven people. So it really, I, I was born with it. Uh, some people say I should have been an accountant. No way. <laughs> I would have been good at it, but I don't think I'd have been happy. Okay. So cool. So here you are, you're leading a new salon. Tell us by the way, the name of your salon and just a bit about your team. Uh, we are called the Abode Salon and Spa, and it came about with me opening up on my own home property in rural New London. We are two to three miles outside of town on my home property in a pole shed, giant pole shed, um, and it's on my home property, so abode means home or dwelling, and I thought, oh, how funny. <laughs> Welcome to my humble abode, mm. and so that stuck and grew from there. And within, it was just myself. I was, when I say I did sweet ownership, really, uh, it was me in my own sweet space. And within a few months, I was overbooked, uh, working 60 hours a week, turning business away. And I had a business coach at the time, not in the salon industry, but just a, a general business coach, which really led me to everything else. And I owe so much to her. She's the one that helped me decide I needed to open my salon and helped me decide I needed to hire. So when I was working so much, she said, Janet, you need to, you need to hire. I said, I don't, I don't want to work with anyone. She goes, no, 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 not a coworker, an employee. And that's when the light bulb went on. I'm like, oh yeah. And then I have, I shouldn't say control, but I, I needed to have control of my environment. I wanted to do things well like no one else has in our area before. Instead of just kind of half-assing things, it, it's got to be done well. So I was so afraid, and this has been a theme for me throughout this whole journey, is I always did it scared, but I had a, another mentor that said, even if you have to do it scared, do it anyway. So I hired a, an employee at, <laughs> since I was scared, 13 hours a week because I was so afraid to have to pay full-time wages if she wasn't busy. And she had been full-time since her first week. <laughs> she was, we were swamped. So we just joke like, who hires, who takes a job at 13 hours a week? Well, she did. <laughs> she saw the vision and believed. 
Um, yes. incredible. And so are you, is this still your location or have you grown into a different spot? It is, it is still our same location. We, uh, a couple of years after actually during the pandemic, we, we kept growing. And when the pandemic happened, I had already started to make plans to expand and then we were shut down and I signed the, uh, contract agreement to, to expand anyway. And once again, I did it scared, but I knew some salons would not make it through this and some didn't. And we were able to take them on and they knew the vision that we were expanding. So for about six months, six, nine months, we were um, kind of working on top of each other and, but everyone knew the vision was there and we, we did take on a, a, a couple few new stylists during that time and we all worked well together and finished the expansion and then kept on growing and growing you did you in the last year had 43 percent increase in revenue and you congrats on that by the way that's huge <laughs> thank you um what do you feel is really the number one reason or top reasons that that growth took place? Uh, well, business foundations for sure, but you could say that, but what does that actually mean? And the, the hard concrete steps were hiring a one-on-one -on -one salon business coach that is tailored for your individual business uh, and learning how to track numbers and analyze them and create systems within your business and organization so it's uniform across the board. Okay. So you are a business coach and yet the coach needs a coach. Talk to me about what was a game changer in that process of having your own one-on-one -on -one coaching. Uh, well, so I actually went, I was not a coach when I hired my coach. The reason I became a coach is we had done so well with coaching that they asked me to come on with them. So when you win the top 200 award, this was for back in 2021. So it wasn't just last year, it was the, for the year of 2021 growth. So uh, during that time, I had started the process of becoming a coach and it takes a few years with Inspiring Champions to do all of their trainings, plus the coaches training, plus uh, other trainings. So it's definitely a process. You have to be very committed. The game changer was when we looked at our numbers from when I started coaching within the first year, we grew our profit alone by 727%. <laughs> yeah. So the growth was there. We grew, but we, our profit grew even more. So we that had been profitable number. That is the more right. Number, right? Like, amazing. Yeah. yeah. When I uh, first went to the very first training with inspiring champions, which was cash flow camp. I, this is almost embarrassing, but it's so relevant to so many people uh, in real. Uh, I checked into the hotel and I was $30,000 in credit card debt. And when I checked in, my card declined at the front desk. Oh, if there was ever a moment that was like, yes, you need to be here, that was it. And I knew I had to digest every single second of that training if I was going to make it through. And within a year, I was debt free because wow. of that training. So I, I wholly believe in the systems and inspiring champions because of what it's done for me and mm -hmm. my business and my team. Most of my team are the breadwinners in their family. They out earn their husbands. And that to me is success. Wow. That's huge. Incredible. And, and I'm curious, you had mentioned kind of shifting services. At first I thought you just took nail services off your menu. Is that the case? Or did you look at things in a different way and decide these are going to be services across our entire business that we will no longer provide? Uh, yep, I took them off of my personal menu, and we still have team members that do them um, on a limited basis based on their 
tracking their numbers. We watch that, we analyze it every week, every day actually. We, we track numbers daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annually. Tell us a little bit of what that, what that looks like. So if you could imagine there's a new salon owner listening today who is, doesn't have that foundation in place. When you track numbers, what are the numbers you're tracking and, and why? Mm, yes, so important. Uh, so we have free booking percentage. And I know the industry is really uh, poo-pooing free booking right now. Uh, and I totally understand why. Uh, but it's still very relevant and necessary and important, just in a different way than it used to be, you know, even five years ago. Uh, so pre-booking is still uh, the number one way to grow your business. Uh, you're obviously your service revenue, the amount of clients per day, so average service ticket, retail to service. Retail is still very relevant and... Um, that's it just blows my mind when their industry gurus are saying you know re uh, retail is a thing of the past it's a huge revenue builder and it creates loyalty with your clientele they're spending all this money on their hair we need to take care of it so anyway it got a little off topic there uh and then productivity is another huge one so how how booked are you you know when you know that you're 80 to 85 percent booked for 12 weeks or more Time to raise your prices, which can be another scared move, mm -hmm. but do it scared. So do it anyway. Uh, so I'm just trying to think what other ones off the top of my head. New guests also tracking that and retention of the new guests and retention with your core clients or existing clients. They're the same thing. And trying to think, I'm so visual, so I have to like have a thing in front of me. What else do we track? Uh, so that's as a stylist, but a salon owner should also be tracking your budget. Uh, I track my budget uh, sometimes weekly if I have certain goals, but definitely bi-weekly and monthly. So right down to your rent, your color, um, what else is there? Retail, what you're spending on retail is the number one budget buster for a salon. They historically overspend on retail every month and that's where they're losing money so knowing what you spend and what you bring in and so having a budget for that as well as supplies those two rent supplies and retail are the budget busters for slot so interesting um rent is kind of this typically invariable expense when we talk about the variations that can come into play with retail what trap do owners get in and that becomes the the thing that robs them of their profit? As far as rent goes? Uh, retail. Retail. Okay. So they just buy to fill the shelves instead of tracking what they actually sell. So an easy way to do it right off the bat is say you sell $1,000 a month, a month in retail. So then your budget should really only be less than $500. So you're making $500 a month. But typically what happens is they sell $1,000 a month and then they order $1,000 or $1,500 a month and then their shelves just get more full and more full and more full. I can walk into a salon and immediately know if they're over budget on their retail just by looking at their shelves. Yeah. So we can send every, <laughs> if you want to follow Janet, we have her website and social media, uh, Instagram and our show notes. I don't know if you're open to get in DMs, but how funny if somebody's taking a picture, here's a picture of our retail area. What do you think? <laughs> but <laughs> I would need some numbers too, like yeah. how many stylists do you have and all that, but typically, or how many chairs, typically I can tell just by looking at the retail shelves and how many chairs you have. It is a trap because it, it, I can see that being a challenge with, oh, we have these new product releases coming out. Um, yeah, it is an interesting thing. And I'm all about the retail. I think retail is alive and well, and people mm -hmm. want it. They're going to buy it. Might as well be from you. So I like that. you Within 24 up. hours, they're buying from somewhere else once they leave your, your salon. The average... Client is buying shampoo, conditioner, any type of hair product within 24 hours of leaving your salon. 
why wouldn't it be from you? Yeah. Well, because you are so numbers oriented, uh, and I, I really see that you have a lot of drive. What are some of your main objectives yet for 2024? Well, uh, getting through some, I'm just kidding. I, <laughs> <laughs> we, I work really hard winter and fall months and then summer, I kind of slack off because we really only get the three months out of the year. Um, so really team development. I have some team members that we're, we have some lofty goals. So we're really focusing on the individuals and we have some opportunities coming up for uh, suite rental in our salon and uh, hiring. So we're, we're going to be hiring a, uh, another commission stylist with experience. And that is, that is all for the rest of this year. So you had mentioned moving into a hybrid model and providing a way for stylists who are ready to go out on their own, that they could do that with you. Is that all underneath the one location? Yes. Yep. Tell me a bit about your vision for that. Well, so the vision is, you know, like I said, I like to have control of my environment in that it's more of the culture and the vibe. So before I would take on a booth rent stylist, I want to see if they're a fit for our culture first. So hiring them with the intention that they would someday want to go booth rent or suite rent under our umbrella in our location is great. If that's the track that they want to do, we will develop that track for them. Uh, it's very important to have that career path for each individual stylist, whether you know, I've got one right now that is just super passionate about education. She wants to be an educator. Perfect. Let's create that path for you. One is entering into leadership. Perfect. Let's help create that path for you and connecting you to where you need to be for that. Others are still developing what they want to do in their career path. And some are just passionate creating, uh, creating with their clientele. They love doing what they're doing. That's perfectly fine. Some may be passionate about becoming a salon owner one day. So let's create that path for you so you know how to track and be successful. And if you decide that it's just too much, great. You can stay booth rent. You can stay suite rent. You can come back to being a commission stylist. So it really creates that safety net of trying it and not having that risk of moving to a new location and losing those clients that you work so hard to retain. I think there's owners listening who are probably considering hybrid. When you kind of stack the pros and the cons together, what would be any reason you wouldn't want to do it? And do you think that this model is the kind of the future uh, business models for salon owners? Yeah, that's an interesting question because typically hybrid in the past historically has not worked. And there, the reason is uh, you have commission stylists and uh, booth rent stylists working together side by side, and some have freedoms that others don't have. So it is very hard if you don't have them separated. So if you can, re can create a space under the same location where you can have your booth rent stylist separate from your commission stylist, or move your commission stylist who already are doing what you're you created with your culture, they're, they're, they're a fit for your culture already. Then the difference is that they're, they're coming and going as they please, but they're already doing what they need to do. So there's a little difference there. You need to create the expectation and the boundaries and the rules and have a lease agreement that this is, these are, this is how it's going to be here. Well, it sounds like you have a very large space. Were you able to build that out to create those separate areas? Um, are they kind of individual closed off rooms or how did you go about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have, it's a 48 by 48 building. Currently we're in half of it. So we do have space to build out the other side to more suite rental if we so choose. Uh, currently we're lucky enough that we already had some of these rooms and spaces available that we can do the suite rental part. Uh, and we could also do booth rent and keep them separate if we so choose. 
it just depends on the individual. It, everything here is curated to the individual. What's going to work? What's not going to work? We spend a lot of time just really thinking about all the angles. And now I will say some things pop up that you never thought about, but at least, you know, the basics are out of the way. So you have time and energy to think about what does pop up and you can pivot if need be. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, there's there's a lot to be inspired by with your journey and the goals that you've achieved and just how you are really on top of tracking and measuring, but also thinking future. Um, so I love that. And if you kind of say, Hey, this is what abode's going to look like over the next five years. What would that, what would you say to that? Yeah. So what it looks like is we, we will be hybrid and there is the possibility even of somebody trying out a micro salon, having their own stylist that they hire under our, it would be more of a collective at that point. And that, I mean, at that point, we'd be busting at the seams and then we would add on to the other half of the space for more, more room. Uh, but yeah, we will be hybrid and we have a few stylists on track to be $100,000 a year stylists. So that's my vision is to create that abundance and wealth in rural America that people think stylists are, you know, that that uh, stigma of, you know, hairstylists are broke and flighty. No, not, not in today's world. So you, people think you got to go to the cities, the big city to make the money. And no, nope, it, you can have an abundant life out, out in the boondocks here. You know, you're not making, you know, millions of dollars, but you are living an abundant life and you're able to take vacations. You're able to have health insurance, able to have a sick day. You can have a baby and not struggle to pay for daycare or groceries. That's all we're looking for is to be able to pay and support yourself and still have time, energy, money left over to take a vacation, save for retirement. It's all about the retirement for me. <laughs> so that's well, my vision. Yeah, I think it's amazing. I and you're so crystal clear with it that I could literally picture it, which I think is so important. And just your focus on growing the people is a testament to why you've had tremendous growth in your business's revenue. So congratulations again on that. Before we're done though, what would be some final words of encouragement for everybody listening today? Oh, yes. Uh even if you have to do it scared, do it anyway. As the great Lauren Gartland Roberts says, if you must do it scared, do it scared. <laughs> it's good. And it's been a part of your story clearly since we started talking today. So I appreciate getting to meet you, Janet. Hopefully someday we get to meet in person, but thank you so much for your time and for sharing your story here with us today. Thank you so much for the invite. It has been my pleasure. Awesome. And we thank all of you for joining us here week after week at Beyond the Technique. If you appreciate this platform, we would love it if you could take a moment and leave us a positive review wherever you're listening so that more people like yourself will discover Beyond the Technique, where we're here to change the way that you are supported in your business. Until next time, everybody, have an awesome day and stay strong.